Hi, this is Brian Panish, the host of Get in the Game podcast for lawyers and people interested in the legal field. If you like what you hear, remember, sharing is caring. Please subscribe and get into the game. Hi, everyone, and welcome. Today, we're joined by Robert Bucola, one of the top trial lawyers in America. Robert practices in Sacramento and throughout California and the Western United States and in the East Coast with the firm of Dreyer, Babbage, Bucola, Wood, Campora, LLP, located in Sacramento, California. Robert's a graduate of the University of California, Berkeley, undergrad, where he was a scholar athlete. Also, he was a graduate of the University of Pacific School of Law, McGeorge in Sacramento. He's been practicing lawyer for over 30 years. So Robert, welcome. Good to be here. Let's talk a little bit about your background. What is it that drove you or an interest in the law? Well, let me correct one thing you said about scholar athlete. I don't think I was much of a scholar. And if you consider being a star in intramurals, uh, an athlete, uh, that was me. Uh, what uh, actually interested me in the law, uh, interestingly, was in the eighth grade, we had a trial uh, involving the Miranda case, and they picked two prosecution lawyers and two defense lawyers, and I was one of them. And I thought it was really fascinating. And at that point in time, my parents had, had me slated to be an orthodontist because you get Wednesdays off and make good money. I remember coming home freshman year after football practice, and I said to my dad, I said, hey, dad, uh, I was reading a book called the F. Lee Bailey for the Defense. And I said, what do you think if uh, I wanted to... Uh, be a lawyer. And he said, well, if you do, be one like Mort Friedman, who lived a couple doors down, who was a plaintiff personal injury lawyer. So that's kind of the catalyst. So what was it that drove you to want to be a trial lawyer? Well, you know, whenever you see anything uh, in the movies, on TV, any of that is your condition. The exciting part of it isn't the desk work that we do every day or reading transcripts. The exciting part of it is that kind of showdown in court. And I think if, if you love competition, which I've always loved, that was just a natural kind of transition and flow. And then when I was in law school, I saw a lot of you know, motivational speakers, uh, trial lawyers uh, put on uh, various aspects of evidence they just put on in trials, and it was just very fascinating to me. So that was what I wanted to do, honestly, from the time I was a freshman in high school. Now you mentioned uh, Mort Friedman, kind of a person you looked up to, a mentor. Why is it important for young lawyers or people that want to be a lawyer to have mentors? And how is it that Mort Friedman helped mentor you in your career? Uh, Mort really, if you go back in time, uh, had all the talent in one office. You know, his young lawyers had Roger Dreyer, Joe Babbage, Parker White. Uh, the list went on, really accomplished uh, other lawyers like Wade Thompson and, and John Poswell, et cetera. And he kind of set a template, as I know you do in your firm, about how these cases are to be handled, you know, with giving lawyers latitude, et cetera. But the results that they were obtaining back then, I mean, people don't remember, but in the early 70s, if you got a $400,000 verdict, that was a big verdict. And they were down there all the time getting results like that. So uh, it was, uh, and he wanted to see a difference made and kind of had the attitude that the insurance company is the enemy and we need to protect those in society that uh, have the least amount of protection. So it was kind of a whole philosophy and mentality that came out of this one office. And from that office, there were many uh, spring outs from there. And so Mort was always a lawyer I always greatly looked up to. And initially, as a defense lawyer, I had cases opposite him and found that the demeanor I got over the phone wasn't the same demeanors I got when I was playing with his son, Mark, two houses down, I can tell you that. Well, let's talk about it your career. You, you went to law school in Sacramento, where you're from. Did you start working right away? Were you hitting the books? How did you handle that? Yeah, I was on the uh, trial ad team at McGeorge. And that was back then they were, it was pretty coveted would win, you know, year after year. And uh, I was told by one of the proctors, basically, that there was a firm in town that was looking for a law clerk that did tons of trial work. And that firm was Donahue, uh, Callahan and Hill. And uh, I knew Jim Donahue Jr., who's a great lawyer here in town now. We both began law clerking there. But I always began to work there with a view toward, you know, skip and ship and working with the plaintiff side. So after clerking for two years and uh, trying some defense cases, which was rare, but you could do it back then, 
Uh, I had an opportunity to join Wade Thompson and Roger Dreyer, who had split off from Mort Friedman just a couple of years before. And that was way back in 1985, and I took that opportunity. What, what was it that you found useful or valuable in your career as being a lawyer that was on the other side of the aisle defending clients? What is it that you learned that helped you that you were able to carry forward into your practice today? You know, back in the day, the Donahue firm had, it seemed like, a lawyer or two in trial all the time. And Bill Callahan and Jim Donahue were trying very big cases against highly accomplished lawyers throughout the state. Uh, big stakes cases. And the reality is, uh, I can only recall uh, that firm losing half a dozen cases or so and all the time I was there, and they were in trial constantly. Uh, and uh, what I was able to take from that experience is that you better have a well-prepared plaintiff, you better know what boogers you have in a case, you better be prepared to inoculate them and eliminate them from the process before you uh, you know, before a jury hears about the bad facts from the defendant. So just the meticulousness and all the different ways the defense can trip up a meritorious case. And they did it routinely in that firm and did it extraordinarily. So whenever I was uh, helping to work on the defense of a case, I was always wondering, gee, how would I do this differently? And then the opportunity came up to join Wade Thompson and Roger. So you joined these two great trial lawyers, Roger Dreyer, Wade Thompson. Roger, obviously, at the time was much younger than Wade. Right. He was an up-and-comer and has obviously gone on to great things as a trial lawyer. Wade was a more sage, savvy, veteran trial lawyer. You come into that firm. What happened to the firm? How did it grow? How did it change? Well, since 1985 now, that would be, what, 34 years your firm's been going since you've joined. Right. Uh, well, initially, you know, Wade was, uh, you know, handling a lot of the very, very big cases, and Roger was handling cases that were obviously meritorious, uh, but that were not necessarily huge until he got to trial. So, uh, Joe Babbage was there. It was just the four of us. We started, we did not have a law clerk, uh, and I think we had a secretarial staff of maybe four or five, and it was kind of a boutique practice. And Wade was very tough. I mean, Wade reminds me personality-wise, intellect-wise, and everything else, uh, much of, I've told you this before, you, and so do the partners in this firm feel that way. But Wade was one of those guys that believed that don't put up anybody's nonsense, be fair to the other side, and be ready to try the case and do your homework. And so that was kind of the mentality that, that I grew up on. And he'd ridicule people. He'd settle a case uh, you know, for 50 grand and you should have gotten 80, boy, you'd be teased to death about that. But it was all with, with uh, good intentions. So the firm from 1985, you start off, you said you had uh, Wade Thompson, Roger Dreyer, Joe Babbage, yourself, four lawyers. Correct. How has the firm progressed to today? How many lawyers today? Sure. We have 29 today. As of uh, June of 87, Roger... Uh, and I and Joe split off and formed our firm. And of course, we vowed never to be a firm larger than a total of eight lawyers. And of course, that promise has been broken. We've had three different offices since and now we're finally in our final home office, we believe. But we've added lawyers only because the complexity of the cases have increased. And as you well know, you need more horsepower on those kinds of cases. Our business model is different than most. I mean, we do take smaller meritorious cases. Obviously, the partners in, in our firm are handling, uh, you know, significant catastrophic injury cases, but we still handle the smaller meritorious cases. So as a result, it's all through word of mouth. We don't do any advertising. We uh, have just grown to this size uh, and not with the design, but just out of necessity. Tell us a little bit about the firm. What kind of cases you handle, what kind of cases go to trial, what the lawyers do in the firm? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. We handle uh, cases across the entire really spectrum of tort law, there's a few types of cases we don't handle. I mean, we handle all auto-related type cases and trucking and motorcycle, which about every office does. We also handle roadway design cases. We handle construction cases, which uh, I love when you get a good one, uh, that's for sure. Uh, we handle uh, multiple forms of governmental entity cases. Uh, we do not do uh, medical malpractice, although we do legal malpractice and insurance bad faith. Um, we typically do things in this firm on a team approach. We're a, a, a partnership that we have attorney meetings every Thursday morning, et cetera, to discuss issues where all the attorneys are supposed to attend, although we get about half of them there most of the time. Uh, but depending upon the sophistication of a case will dictate who captains the case. So if there's obviously a big 
a difficult double amputation case against you know Caltrans or something like that uh, downstairs, then Roger will likely be the, the, the captain with that case with other lawyers uh, working on it uh, with him. But despite the fact that we do things on a team approach, each lawyer has his or her individual caseload as well. Okay, you got a big law firm. It's important to get cases, to keep the lawyers busy, to keep the doors open. You being on a contingent practice, you're only getting paid when you win or settle the case. Right. How do you go about, for a young lawyer, getting more cases? Do you go on the internet? Do you go on TV? What's the best tips you can give to lawyers trying to build a practice? Well, Brian, as you probably remember, um, back when we were young lawyers, uh, Insurance defense lawyers seldom handle PI cases. Every now and then one would hang on to them. Uh, and as a result, you know, we got all those great referrals from our opponents uh, as we ticked along, as well as former clients, word of mouth, et cetera. But as you're building it, I remember budding up to physical therapists, you name it, uh, just uh, so that if they, you know, saw a client in need, they'd say, hey, give Bob Bucola a call or give Roger Dreyer a call or Steve Campbell, whatever it might be. So that was kind of the hustle we did. As time passed, you know, you get some good results, you get a few headlines, uh, you start doing the legal seminars, et cetera. The word of mouth just gets out in a community like Sacramento about, you know, who the good referring uh, ends would be. But in today's day and age, it's awfully competitive. I think that we attract per lawyer far less volume than we ever did historically. The cases we're getting obviously are more serious cases and cases where people do a little bit more research. But it's tough. I think the best thing you can do as a young lawyer is to market yourself with lawyers that may get these cases, whether they're workers' comp lawyers, uh, whether they be other plaintiff lawyers with lesser experience. And you know, as well as I do, many of these PI lawyers don't do any litigation at all. Talk to them uh, about uh, getting cases in. And even more than that, the best way you can market yourself is through getting great results. Having mediators tell someone else, gee, I just had Joe Johnson over here. Boy, did he ever put together a beautiful case, et cetera. So it's, it's really something that you have to have the skills and the results before you'll really attract the quality cases. Uh, and you've got to get your name out there. I know you've been involved in this American Board of Trial Advocates. I want to talk a little bit about that. You've been named not only the Sacramento Trial Lawyer of the Year, but also for the whole state of California, BOTA. What is a BOTA and why are you a member? Uh, you know, I was uh, admitted uh, when I was relatively young in my career, um, and at the time was actually the youngest chapter member. And that sounds like a pretty good brag point. But the truth of the matter is there were two or three uh, more senior lawyers in that group. And one of them was John Poswall at the time and a few others that I won't name that had very nice things to say at the membership meeting, so I was voted in young. Uh, and it was at the time, I think you had to have 20 jury trials to conclusion, uh, et cetera. And it, it's a nice uh, group of lawyers where there's both a competency requirement, a peer vetting requirement, and then an ethics requirement. So the, the folks in the community that are disreputable get voted out, et cetera. Back when I got in, you couldn't be in if you had more than one negative vote and all uh, abstains counted as a negative. So it was pretty tough to get in. Uh, now it's a little bit more liberal in terms of getting in, but the problem with it is nobody has enough trials these days to get young lawyers in. But it's a neat group. There's brotherhood when you meet uh, at events or socials or whatever. There's no you know you versus them. It's just a, a time of camaraderie and a lot of libation and good food. But it's, it's a nice group because it is uh, very committed to advancing the Seventh Amendment rights, the uh, civil jury trial rights, and there's a lot of educational programs that go on. Uh, judges appreciate having a boat of lawyers because typically, you know, they're the lawyers that are professional, prepared, understand courtroom etiquette, a lot less side fights, et cetera, with these lawyers. And juries and judges typically see a much better presentation of the evidence with lawyers that are members of a boda. You know, you just brought up a good point. When you're in trial, and, and we've all been guilty of it, whether it be sniping at the other lawyer, making faces, comments, what is your experience and how jurors react to that? You know, jurors can't stand it. They really can't. Um, they like to be the ones through their verdict that snipes back at the lawyer that asks unfair questions. Uh, and they, when, when you can restrain yourself and they know you're being tortured by somebody's unreasonable conduct, 
you know, that can turn out to be a nice payday for you. Now, how do I handle it? I'm typically pretty immature. I typically snipe back. Um, it's not unusual to have, you know, the court call me and an opponent up and say, hey, enough. But most of the time when you're trying cases against real quality lawyers and lawyers that have integrity, it goes pretty smoothly. The, the case is, is pretty uh, seamless most of the time. But look, at it's tough when you have somebody that promises you they're not going to call a particular witness. You decide not to depose them. And then the first thing out of the blue, they call that witness when they stand up and, and they're you know, told who you're going to call next. That's tough to deal with when you know it's done dastardly. Uh, it's tough to keep a face of uh, professionalism when that goes on. And I would tell anybody, any trial judge or any uh, lawyer, that unless he or she's been in the trenches with real dastardly, unethical behavior, see how you handle that. But no, you should keep it very professional. And that was your original question. Now, you've had record verdicts in many counties throughout California. What I'd like to do is just talk about some of your favorite cases. First of all, what was your favorite trial you ever had? You know, I can tell you that's a hard one because, um, you know, any case where the result comes in and justice is done for your client, particularly a client you really care about, <clears throat> that feeling is, is uh, very, very uh, uh, soothing. It's gratifying. It makes all your hard work uh, worthwhile. And uh, that's, I've been fortunate enough to have that experience many times. I think probably, if I have to say the most gratifying case, if you had to force me to do it, I would say one I tried in late 1998, and it involved a, a gal that was a passenger in a vehicle. Uh, her driver, her vehicle, if I remember right, had smoked some marijuana. They were young, 18, 19, and they rear-ended a bus up in Nevada County. And she was very, very badly injured. And the argument was the other uh, cars saw the bus, went around, it was disabled. And they got confused and thought the diesel smoke from the disabled bus was a low-hanging cloud. So we had to thread the needle. And fortunately, and it was a very good defense lawyer, but fortunately, the defense lied about some things. And we had a few aha moments in trial. Uh, and we had a great trial judge. And there was divine intervention. We got a real big verdict. Back then, it was you know, 9 million, 9.3 or something, which was, believe it or not, the biggest verdict in Sacramento County history, which, of course, you know, you see these verdicts all the time. But I think the reason it was so gratifying, I cared so much about that plane if she was just a love. Uh, and um, it was just such a threading the needle, minimal offer type case to have everything come the way you want and hit the only party that had the money with 100%. So it was one of those. And so that's kind of one you, you remember. You know, one thing that I hear from lawyers in Northern California is how great Los Angeles venue is. It's not as great as it's cracked up to be, but in a practice in Northern California, there's so many different counties and different types of people. Can you talk a little bit about the different changes from county to county, whether it's conservative? Certainly, most venues in Northern California are not liberals, some can be. Sacramento is the capital of the state. Obviously, you have right. a good cross-section of some state people and highly educated. Talk, talk to us about that and how you confront and deal with conservative jurors. Well, you know, the, the real simple answer is we Northern California trial lawyers that get numbers that, are, you know, a quarter of the ones you routinely get, of course, we attribute it always to venue. Uh, what else are you going to do? That's your, your defense mechanism. But the reality is, and I tease about things, uh, you know, when you're a wonderful trial lawyer, you'll get great results wherever you go. But if you take a look at Sacramento, Sacramento is probably a middle of the road kind of place to try cases. We have a lot of state workers. Uh, we don't have it. Just to tell you, I just recently learned that we've only had, I think, one home ever sell for four million dollars. It was Eddie Murphy's home in Sacramento. And we've only had a few ever sell for over two. Well, that's different than if you come from an environment where you know, a, a, a condo in San Francisco would begin at $2 million. You're just dealing with different economics. But you take to the north of Sacramento, we have Yuba and Sutter County. You go to the west and you have Yolo County. You go to the southeast, you got Amador and Calaveras County. You go directly to the east and you have uh, El Dorado and Placer County. So we're surrounded by such conservative venues. And the reality is, you know, you can't talk uh, general damages of eight figures with many of these folks, many of them are retirees, et cetera. But nevertheless, I believe that if you put an A-plus presentation on, you have a worthy plaintiff, you acknowledge your faults, a jury will do for that locale 
what is it, what is right for the for the plaintiff. And believe me, the insurance company will never have offered squat uh, unless it's the clearest case in those kinds of counties. I mean, I've tracked you know you and I are obviously close friends. I've seen you go into in tough counties and get big verdicts. It ain't as easy as being in downtown Chicago, I suppose, but it is absolutely doable and you should not run from your venue. But by the same token, don't expect that some jury in a back surgery case in Alpine County is going to give you five million bucks. It's just not likely to happen. People think of economics differently. Do, do you adjust how you try the case when you're in a conservative venue? You know, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, I, I think a little bit. I think you have to adjust uh, your economics. We are getting ready to go try a case in Wyoming in a pretty conservative area. And the economics are huge. They scare me. I wish they weren't as big as they were because they, and they are, they're just having to deal with it. I think no matter where you try a case, you have to think that jurors look at you like ambulance chasers and you lack credibility. And unless you know the judge or the judge knows you, uh, the judge even kind of feels that way. So it's not until day two, day three, day four, when they see how prepared you are, they see how the cross-examinations go, they see how uh, you're not lying about the evidence, you're acknowledging uh, shortcomings, et cetera, that you start winning credibility. So I think you've got to try a case uh, as though you're dealing with conservative folks anywhere uh, up here in Northern California. I think the same is probably even true in downtown uh, LA Central. You can just put bigger numbers on. So I think the overall answer is no, you really don't try it differently, but you got to be careful about the kinds of numbers you ask for in some of these venues. And we've heard all about these cases you've done. One thing that's really impressed me is your involvement in your community and your philanthropic interest. One thing that you've actually got me involved with is the Sacramento Child Advocates. You've done some great work for them. Talk to us about that. Why do you think it's important for lawyers to give back and be involved in their community? Well, in a, 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 a similar organization as CASA as well, the, 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 uh, the, uh, local court advocates for foster care kids. We have in Sacramento County about 6,000 foster care kids. And if you really follow their plight, it's pretty sad. The average foster care child will live in six or seven homes before he or she reaches age 18. And then of course there really isn't any program left for them to speak of at age 18. So what the, what the system badly needs is each of these kids to have ombudsmen, so to speak, to protect their rights. And so it's kind of neat to see local lawyers give some of their time to devote to one of the CASA kids or one of the uh, kids in the child abuse prevention program, et cetera. And the amount of resources that are allocated uh, through state funding and federal funding is really only about 35% of what their needs are. So the rest has to come from fundraising. And as much as lawyers get bashed, you know, I find, I called you and the first thing you said is how much? Uh, and and uh, I find that response to be not so much how much, but sure, I'll be there and who do I write my check to, et cetera. And uh, lawyers, I listened to a federal court judge once say that if you take a look at any board of trustees, charitable trustees, you see lawyers are disproportionately populating them. So uh, it's great because we have a good audience here in town. I can get on the phone and make 40 calls and typically half of them will say, sure, I'll give money. And it's it goes to the right cause and makes you feel a little bit better about you know driving a nice car and being able to go out to eat when you want. One last thing is we're running out of time. You know, lawyers are always saying, well, I got this much, or how much did you get in the case? But I know that you and your firm and you and your partner, Steve Campora, have really been leaders in the area of non-economic conditions and settlement. For example, I know you had a pg e case that resulted in a uh, huge sub explosion in suburban Sacramento, and as part of the settlement, you and Mr. Campora insisted that PG&E would agree to dig up and inspect 75 other lines in the Sacramento area to prevent this from happening to others. Tell us a little bit about that and how you do that. Yeah, once we it looked like we were coming to terms in terms of the uh, injury and, and wrongful death cases that we handle along with you in your office, um, we wanted to make certain that the lines were appropriately inspected to avoid high consequence calamity. So one of the things that Steve Campora really principally put together along with engineers is PG&E's promise over I think an 18 or 20 month period that all of the high consequence lines, those are the lines that go through metropolitan areas and run underneath movie theaters, et cetera, were hydrostatically tested, which means pressurized to make certain that there are no defects. And 
from that uh, work, they can predict the useful work life of a remaining line and put them on replacement schedules. So that was part of the deal. And we gave the plaintiffs the individual enforcement right. And it turns out that PG&E did at least uh, follow that. As you know, your office is involved, as is mine and others, as lead counsel in the fire cases uh, up in Northern California and in the Southern California fires. We expect when these cases resolve to, to be implementing uh, uh, promises on the part of the utility that takes over to make sure that these fires are averted and that we get the appropriate shutoff systems in place, et cetera. And I, I think that goes in line with what I understand of your firm slogan to be making a difference, not only monetarily, but for the community in the whole, not only philanthropically, but in the non-economic conditions you're able to obtain for your clients and others. So thank you for all the great work. Unfortunately, we've run out of time, and we look forward to having you back again. Thank you so much for joining us, Robert. Pleasure to be here. Thanks. Hi, this is Brian Panish. Remember, sharing is caring. If you like what you hear, please subscribe. Get into the game.